greetings and salutations. Today we're going to have a new study and its title is What Will You Do With Christ? The Bible says that God is love. Love is not just one of his attributes, but he is love, which means that all his other attributes flow from him who is love. God is good because he is love. He is merciful and pitiful because he is love. He is holy and just because he is love. He is patient and meek because he is love. The foundation and security of our salvation is found in God's nature, which is love. He who is love also gave us the gospel of salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. To be able to understand and accept good tidings, gospel, about our salvation, we need to be rooted and grounded in God's love. The greatest obstacle to understanding God's love is our own love. The paradox consists of the fact that the same word love describes two different types of love that are completely opposite. God's love is eternal and never fading nor ending. It is selfless and self-sacrificing. Human love is changeable and unreliable, selfish, turned to itself and looking for its own security. How will selfishness understand selflessness? That seems crazy. That is why our mind is at enmity with God and does not and cannot obey God's law of love. This enmity was revealed in the incident with the rich young ruler and Christ's call to sell everything and follow him. It seemed to him that obedience to Christ would ruin him. If he had obeyed Christ through the crucifixion of his will and submission to the will of Christ, then God's selfless love would have been revealed in his selfish life. This fickle and unreliable love is the only love we can give and show on our own. That is why Jesus, through the experience of new birth, wants to give us his agape love through his Spirit, so to glorify himself through his people. In complete contrast to human love, God's agape love is eternal. God has declared, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. God's gave charity never faileth in 1 Corinthians. On the cross, Jesus showed how he loved his own which were in the world. He loved them unto the end. When we understand the love of Christ which passeth all understanding, which is turned towards us and which is eternal, unchangeable and unconditional, then we are going to be rooted and grounded in love. Then will our heart say, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughterer. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. By the first birth, Jesus became literally divine being, born from God. Having that on mind, he was always joyfully and thankfully submissive to his Father, because of the agape love he has. In John 1.18 says, No man had seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he had declared him. He who is out of his bosom came to declare him. Out of deep gratitude to the Father who passed him divinity at birth, Jesus the Son of God was from eternal times always submitted to the Father and never wanted to compare himself to God, but always gave him glory. So it will be in the endless future. 
the Son will always obey the Father out of love and deep gratitude, for he had put all things under his feet. But when he said all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. For as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. Jesus greatly appreciated that he received divinity from the Father. That is why he was infinitely grateful to him, and he loved the Father so selflessly that he was ready to sacrifice his divinity, so that his Father would be glorified and justified from Satan's lies and attacks. That is why Jesus is the Father's beloved Son, because the Father's divine agape love resides in him. Jesus did something magnificent for us. He left his divine immortal body to take a perishable mortal body, the form of a servant, and through cruel suffering, uncertainty, and the risk of eternal loss, he fought for us to save us. Divine agape love does not glorify itself, it does not seek its own, it is humble and honors others. That is why the Father says, that he gave all judgment to the Son, that he created everything through Son and for Son, that whoever honors the Son also honors him, and whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. The Son says that he can do nothing without the Father. As he hears from the Father, he does so. The Son wants to do only the will of his Father, and it is important to emphasize that he did this even before the Incarnation. During the creation of all things, Jesus joyfully carried out the will of his Father. In this way, the Father and the Son reveal to us how by the deed this love is practically shown. A gape love and war in heaven. The first being in heaven to rebel against God's selfless and self-sacrificing love, which is revealed in God's law was Satan. For him, the idea that love does not glorify itself, does not puff up, does not seek its own, does not get angry, endures everything, was too limiting. He rebelled against that love and decided to introduce a new law of self-love. Since his fall, he has not stopped fighting against God's self-sacrificing love. Seeing Christ in agony, not giving up this agape self-sacrifice and love, Satan inspired the people to shout, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. He saved others, himself he cannot save. The enemy has inserted into Christianity the idea of gospel, which is twisted and it reads, I and Christ. Translated, this means selfishness and selflessness. However, the true gospel reads, not I, but Christ in me, which would mean not selfishness, but only Christ's selflessness. Through the death of his Son, God showed us unconditional, agape love, while we were still weak, sinful, helpless and enemies of God. God's eternal and unconditional agape love makes the gospel also unconditional and eternal. Jesus incarnated to take our fallen carnal nature that is alienated from God in order to crucify it completely and to put it to death and condemn sin and save man from his carnal and hostile mind. In the flesh, Christ had the same temptations that we have. However, he was the Lord over sin, and that's how he never failed. Even at a young age, Jesus recognized the essence of his mission and reason why the Father sent him into the world. So we also need to recognize why we were born and why the Father sent us to come to this world 
and for what reason he keeps us alive every day. What is the top secret that Creator imprinted in the nature? It is the principle of the cross written in the seed. This is the most basic and essential message that every farmer has constantly before his eyes as he throws seeds into the ground to receive his food. How can the problem of death be solved and how can an evil man become good? The only and true way is the way of the cross. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come, that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, he abideth alone. But if he die, he bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. A seed that seeks for safety in a box achieves nothing. Indulge in self, it remains alone and useless and eventually dies. Death conquers the seed, which is spiritually healthy and though no fault of its own, laid in a cold grave in the dark earth. Only by dying it can bear many fruits. Even as a child, watching the lamb being sacrificed, the Son of God understood that his sacrifice would become the seed for many sons and daughters of God to be brought into the glory. His youthful mind made the firmest decision that he would make himself to be a seed. He will throw away his security, comfort and everything he considers important and precious into the ground to die, so that the Father's unconditional love may be revealed and demonstrated in his life. Renunciation of own will, own feelings and ways in favour of the Father's became the principle of the cross which became a mysterious and powerful weapon by which he defeated death. This choice and decision of Christ to suffer as a lamb was so contrary and unacceptable to human nature that it seemed to every man then as it is today to be folly. For this reason Jesus did not tell the disciples about his suffering until they accepted him as the Messiah. The first disciple who accepted him as the Messiah was also the first to reject his cross and suffering. We read about it. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bihona, for flesh and blood had not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. From that time forward began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get behind me, Satan, thou art an offence unto me, for thou savourest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. After his renunciation, Peter was completely converted, and accepted God's self-sacrifice in a gape love. When did that happen? Conversation between Jesus and Peter. So when they had dined, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, 
Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me a gay love more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He said unto him the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me a gay love? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me, Philos love. Peter was grieved because he said him the third time, lovest thou me. And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee, love thee by the Philos love, that is the brotherly love, human love. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. And now when Peter was humbled, Jesus could gift him that divine agape love. Christ was the seed that brought forth many fruits through his death. Let's look at Apostle Peter, who was with Christ, but fought with all his might against the way of the cross. And in the end, Peter himself accepted to go that way. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou was young, thou girdlest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall girl thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. God is love. We are practically shown this by Christ's sacrifice, where God had sacrificed for his creatures selflessly with no calculations. This love infinitely surpasses human love, which is selfish and easily misses the point. The love that Jesus gives sacrificing his divinity and eternal existence for the benefit of fallen creatures practically shows that it comes from God. That love is infinitely greater than human love as much as God is greater than man. Every sincere person is deeply aware that such love comes only from God and does not reside in man, and that the enmity of the people who took the life of God's Son is in fact our enmity towards God. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The law of God refers to the law of love expressed in the Ten Commandments, which is a transcript of God's holy character. The carnal mind with which we are born by its selfish nature does not obey God's unselfishness, neither it can, neither it will. We cannot build love on selfishness, because that is not love but the opposite. We cannot build love on security and fears, because it is not a gay love, pure, divine, and holy. God's love is built on selflessness, on the risk of eternal loss, self-sacrifice, and insecurity. Jesus revealed this to us on the cross. Jesus wants to give us that love. What will you do with Christ is the question now. For this reason we have often not experienced the peace that Jesus promised us. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The reason for our turmoil is the absence of Christ from the soul. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted in thee. The reason we often don't experience that peace is that we consult with our fears and doubts, and then our minds waver. We need the unselfish mind of Christ. Anyone who builds on fears and securities is building on a foundation that will surely collapse, which God cannot bless. The love of God does not rest on fears and security, but on risk loss and insecurity. If we want to be perfect, we need to crucify and reject this kind of selfish thinking in order to have the mind of Christ. This is what God will bless and this reveals and glorifies 
in our life. Didn't the Lord Jesus clearly depict it to us in simple and profound words? Whoever wants to save his soul will lose it. Where is the safety there? Human love is egoistic and self-centered and constantly seeks security. For God, that is the ultimate selfishness, opposite and disgusting to his selflessness and self-sacrifice. What we consider to be love is filthy and acceptable to God. Whoever denies himself and his security and accepts the advice to joyfully lose his soul for Christ has chosen the best way to save his soul. For God would not allow any of his self-sacrificing children to perish. A proud heart aspires to merit salvation. But our right to heaven and our eligibility for it is based on the righteousness of Christ. The Lord cannot do anything for the restoration of a man until he, convinced of his own weakness and freed from any thought that he is sufficient on his own, submits to God's guidance. Then he can receive the gift that God longs to give him. Nothing is denied to a soul that feels its need. It gives them unlimited access to him in whom all fullness is found. For thus said the high and lofty one that inhabited eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. While those who submit to the influence of the spirit of Christ start a battle with themselves, those who hold fast to sin battle against the truth and its bearers. The difficulties we encounter in our life can be greatly lessened with the meekness that is hidden in Christ. If we have the humility of Christ in us, we will rise above the contempt, blame on others and difficulties to which we are exposed every day, and they will cease to overshadow our spirit with gloom. The highest proof of a Christian's nobility is self-control. He who does not preserve a gentle and steadfast spirit in the face of abuse or cruelty deprives God of the right to reveal in him the perfection of his character. When the law was declared on Sinai, God declared to mankind the holiness of his character, so that by highlighting the contrast between him and us, we could see the sinfulness of our character. The law was given to us to convict us of sin and reveal to us our need for the Savior. Christ's purity and holiness reveal to people their need for His blood that cleanses and for His righteousness that justifies. The law is still the way that brings us to Christ so that we could be justified by faith. The law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. Since the law of the Lord is perfect, any departure from it must be a sin. Christ condemns those who disobey God's commandments and teaches others to do the same. The Savior's life of obedience fulfilled all the requirements of the law. He proved that in human nature the law can be kept and he showed the perfection of character that obedience develops. All who are obedient as he was obedient also declare that the law is holy and just and good, and also that Jesus lives in them. The solution for all mankind problems is Christ in us. He that had the Son had life, and he that had not the Son of God had not life. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. The top secret for the Gentiles that God reveals to his faithful is Christ in us, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. After all we have heard, the question is imposed, what will you do with Christ? The following recital invites us to make a decision. Calmly, Jerusalem closed her sleepy eyes. 
to open them to the sun again tomorrow. But she had a heavy sleep during those long dark hours, and the sad awakening was at the dawn of a new morning. Amazed and dreamily she looks, at the foot of Pilate's pillar, stirred up by hatred, the sea of people waves, and above stands a man under a crown of thorns, rough, bound, whipped, and in blood, like a lamb before its shearer is silent. Here is an innocent man, that's a pilot's conscience. Look at the wounded back, the head crowned with thorns. Say whom to let go. Pilot offers them a choice, and they roar angrily. Not Christ, but Barabbas. The city shuddered in horror, watching the work of Pilate, where he shamefully betrays justice and calmly washes his hands. She is amazed. Who pays death to the innocent, and in return for the many good deeds, mockery, cross, and anguish? Everyone is denying him now, and he was everything to everyone. He came to give them heaven again. He exchanged glory for the misery of this earth, and there every tear and pain he knows very well. Because of them, the manger and the straw, and the bloody sweat of that night, the bitterness of this cup and the garden of Gethsemane, because of them, like an innocent lamb, he will calmly go to the cross to pay their debt and by death to destroy the death. O oh, wretched human ignorance, you think that you are passing judgment upon the one who sat alone on the defendant's bench, and you are not even aware that precisely by renouncing him you are choosing the death sentence for your part. And there, in front of Pilate's courtroom, the man's most shameful deed, for which many centuries have been ashamed in their remorse, met with a proof of God's love in the face of Christ, sending the innocent to the cross, to which he calmly goes. Pilate is gone, time tore apart the palaces, woke the city countless times and put it to sleep. By its ashes covered the sea of angry people, and yet, in the same judgment, know that you also stand now. Maybe you are confused by the lies of the angry crowd around you, that our modern age no longer needs Christ, or like Peter you are afraid when it is asked of you to admit that you carry the King of Heaven in your heart. The time of your decision is now, for Christ or Barabbas. You have no other choice, truth or lies, whether vice or justice, shame or glory. What will you do with Christ? You must answer it now. May our answer be, I and my household will serve the Christ. May the Lord bless us all abundantly and greetings to you until our next fellowship. God bless you. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is, we shall be like Him, we shall be like Him. We are the sons of God. First John 3 verse 2 We shall be like Him.